Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokaw. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate capillary net filtration rate. And to do that, I'm going to first explain a little bit of basic physiology of the capillary, how this relates to the equation, and then the second thing we'll do is we'll actually use this equation and perform the calculation. So first of all, we've got a capillary right here. And we're calculating net filtration rate, so we need to understand about some of the processes that facilitate filtration. Okay? So first of all, what is filtration? Well, to answer that, I've got a capillary right here. And inside the capillary is, of course, blood, which is a liquid or fluid. Outside the capillary walls, out here, let's say, I've got the interstitial fluid, or interstitium for short. And filtration is the process by which fluid movement occurs from the capillary into the interstitial fluid. Okay, that's filtration. And there are going to be several processes that facilitate filtration and several processes that go in the opposite direction, which is actually reabsorption. And so if I were to have fluid movement from the interstitial fluid into the capillary, that's the opposite of filtration, that's reabsorption. And so overall what we're going to find is that the forces, or pressures in this case, that facilitate filtration are going to be greater than the forces that facilitate reabsorption. Okay, so the first pressure that we have right here is the capillary hydrostatic pressure. This is the blood pressure or hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. So in other words, the pressure is going to be exerted from the blood here against the capillary walls. And I've shown you the direction that the pressure is exerted. So the capillary hydrostatic pressure is going to tend to force fluid out of the capillary and into the interstitium. And this is a very strong pressure. We can actually see its value right here in this example that we're going to do in a minute is 25 millimeters of mercury. So the capillary has hydrostatic pressure, so does the interstitial fluid. So this piece of IF right here, this is the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. This is the pressure due to the fluid in the interstitial fluid. And it exerts a pressure from the interstitial fluid into the capillary. So in other words, the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure would tend to force fluid from the interstitial fluid into the capillary. And so these two forces are actually going to oppose each other. We can look at the value for the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, and what we actually see is that it's a negative pressure, negative five millimeters of mercury. So obviously the capillary hydrostatic pressure is greater. The reason that the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure is negative is because the lymphatic system is continually draining fluid out of the interstitium into lymphatic vessels. And so ultimately that creates a negative pressure since the pressure in this region is continually decreasing, like a vacuum, so to speak. Okay, these two pressures that I've just mentioned, these are pressures due to the movement of liquid, or at least the presence of liquid, inside the capillary, which is the blood. And so hydrostatic pressures are a type of pressures that exert force against a wall. The capillary hydrostatic pressure exerts the pressure on the wall from within the capillary, whereas the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure exerts a force or pressure on the capillary wall, but it does so from the opposite direction, from the interstitial fluid. In contrast, these pressures over here are what we call osmotic pressures, and they function very differently. So osmotic pressures have to do with the fact that we have proteins in the blood and also proteins in the interstitial fluid. So let's first talk about the proteins in the capillaries right here. These are simply plasma proteins. Uh, about 80% of those are serum albumin, 20% globulins. But the point is, I've got a lot of proteins here in the blood. Now, the way osmotic pressure works is every one of these proteins exerts osmotic pressure. That means that essentially the proteins are attracted to water. In other words, these proteins are like a magnet for water. In other words, fluid is going to be pulled toward the proteins. Okay? So if I have a lot of proteins in the blood, that's going to attract a lot of water. So this pi right here, this is the Greek symbol pi, pi sub C, this is the plasma colloid osmotic pressure. What this basically means, colloid means protein, so to speak, it's in the plasma, and it's an osmotic pressure, meaning that these proteins are attracting water. And so in this case, the plasma colloid osmotic pressure is actually oriented 
into the capillary. Okay? And that's because these proteins attract water, like a magnet. In this case, our plasma colloid osmotic pressure is 25 millimeters of mercury in this example. Okay? Now the other osmotic pressure that we have is going to be due to these proteins in the interstitial fluid. So this right here is the interstitial fluid or interstitial colloid osmotic pressure. And in this case, the value is 10 millimeters of mercury. And again, this osmotic pressure is due to these proteins, and they attract water. And so they're going to tend to pull fluid, that is the water, from the capillary into the interstitial fluid toward themselves. Okay? So understand that osmotic pressures or colloid osmotic pressures are very different than hydrostatic pressures. Okay? In fact, they go in opposite directions. So hopefully all that made sense. Let's go ahead and now calculate the net filtration rate given these values right here. Okay, so this equation gives us the net filtration rate. So what we would do is we would take the capillary hydrostatic pressure, P sub C, minus the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, get a value for that, and then we would subtract, we need to make sure to put this in parentheses, order of operations, the plasma colloid osmotic pressure minus the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, and then we take that difference, notice the brackets outside of that, and whatever we get for all of this, we then multiply it times this capillary filtration coefficient, which is K sub F here. In this case, our K sub F is 10 milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and actually see how we would calculate this. Okay, so our K sub F, like we said, was 10 milliliters per minute per millimeters of mercury, times, we need to figure out all this stuff. So P sub C, that's our capillary hydrostatic pressure, that was 25 millimeters of mercury. We then need to subtract the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. That was negative 5, so minus negative 5. Notice we're subtracting a negative. We'll look at that in just a minute. Then we need to subtract off pi sub c minus pi sub if. Pi sub c, that was our plasma colloid osmotic pressure, that's 25 millimeters of mercury, minus our interstitial colloid osmotic pressure, which was 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so this 25 minus a negative 5, that's essentially 25 plus 5, or 30. 25 minus 10 is 15, so 30 minus 15 milliliters of mercury is 15 millimeters of mercury. And so what I just did is I calculated actually the net filtration pressure. So one important thing is when you're looking at this equation, all the stuff here in the brackets, at least the way I've uh, written it, the stuff in the brackets is actually the net filtration pressure. And so the rule is, if you know the net filtration pressure, you then just multiply by the capillary filtration coefficient, and that gets you net filtration rate. So now we just take our net filtration pressure of 15 millimeters of mercury times the capillary filtration coefficient, 10 milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury, and we get a number of 150 because 10 times 15 is 150. Uh, notice something. If we were to multiply milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury times millimeter of mercury, these two millimeters of mercury units would cancel, and all we'd be left with is milliliters per minute. And that's actually a valid unit for filtration rate. And so in this example, given these numbers, our net filtration rate is 150 milliliters per minute. Okay. So, hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of these forces up here, or pressures, which are actually called starling forces or starling pressures, and actually how to calculate net filtration rate. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.